<laughs> Flag on the play. Take two. Welcome back, Mrs. Ryan. Hello. Hello. Okay. Taking a second. Okay. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> Hello there, Mrs. Ryan. Welcome Hello. back. Yes. Yes. Good morning. <laughs> Good evening. Good evening, everybody. Good evening, everyone. It's not even the morning in real time, let alone I know, for everybody I know. else. <laughs> I know. I just got caught. I could hear the myself back, and I got distracted. Oh, it's the greatest. There we go. All right. Well, I'm happy to be back. Hi, Welcome everyone. back. Hello, everybody. Let's see. Today is Tuesday, April 9, 2019. My name is Jay Ryan. This is Nicole Ryan. We are the Ryans, and this is it's tonight's show. Tonight's guest, uh, I'm pretty excited about. As usual, we've got Mark Scott. Is it Zickery? Yep. Okay, good. Said right. Thank you. <laughs> I forgot to check that ahead of time. Uh, writer, producer, director. Um, we're going to get into all sorts of stuff here uh, today, and I'm pretty excited about that. As is Mrs. Ryan. Yes. Before that, how the heck are you? How was your weekend? Great. What's new? We haven't been here in a few days. Weekend was awesome. Suit got to see a ton of our cool people, cool friends. Um, and then <laughs> I got worn out like I always do, so I rested a lot. That's all right. Yeah. It was a big week last week. Um, can we talk about the guests from last week? Holy smokes. Amazing. Um, uh, Freeman Thomas, for one. Uh, bl blowing up the views on YouTube, by the way. Uh, Freeman Thomas was just a delight. And then we find out in the m middle of that interview that he grew up with Jeff Zwart, who was our Thursday guest. Yeah. Jeff Zwart was here. And my goodness, I'm still swimming from, I think, the emotional high that I was on all weekend after that interview. Yeah. Everybody was talking about it. We went to the, uh, well, we had Breakfast Club, obviously, and people were very enthused. But then on Saturday, we went to the Porsche Experience Center, Los Angeles morning shift, right down on the thing there. Uh, their cars and coffee and holy smokes one it was beautiful weather yeah. and it was packed it's great job GI Gen PECLA everybody uh, involved um, fantastic job really cool cars nice turnout um, great spread as usual and they took care of us too very much so because all of the uh, handicap <laughs> spots had beautiful rainbow colored Porsches in them <laughs> <clears throat> non-disabled people but whatever people who are fine <laughs> luckily gi10 <laughs> took care of things immediately and put us right there uh in fact even even closer so Thanks, uh, we had a great spot and we had a great time thank you so much for taking so much care of us fun. and how many people we got to see and say hello to mm -hmm. all of which who complimented the jeff zwart episode yeah he was there too and so we I'm got hoping to see that, jeff and i'm hoping that people told him the same thing jeff and jezebel Jeff and Jezebel and Hunziger we spent some time with. So then Hunziger's the next uh, the next stop right after that. Went over yeah. to Late Shift over at Hunziger. Busy. Now we'll keep the thank yous going. Heather Norwood, yeah. holy smokes, the spread as usual, Unreal. including the imported cake. They flew the cake in. It's delicious as usual. Great seeing it's everybody. It's German chocolate. Mike Brewer. I haven't cut it. That's right. <laughs> she goes, oh, fuck, I didn't cut the cake. Amazing. Uh, saw Mike Brewer briefly, yep. and then we saw him out on the road too when they were driving that McLaren when giving Nicholas a drive. Anyway, great weekend. Uh, thanks to all involved, we had a blast. Yeah, your energy went at the end, but that's to be expected. That's I mean, what you wore yourself it was out. So much fun. You don't, you don't stop. I don't think it's FOMO with you. I think it's just a desire to do more. When I'm stay having alive. fun, I really like to keep that energy going, and I just zoom past my own. <laughs> yeah, you're not looking at your gauges at that point. Yeah. So but she, it, she I, runs out of gas. I run out of gas. Yeah, that's yeah. a good way to that's put right. it. I'm like an electric car. It is what it is. Look, we still went. Mm -hmm. We still went and did that stuff. Yeah, you know what had I mean? a blast. Who cares if we left early? Good no to see everybody. Uh, I love you, Mrs. Ryan. I think you're a trooper. Everybody else does too. It was cool to see all of that this weekend. Thanks. While you were spilling coffee and falling over at the PEC and everything. <laughs> Disaster. <laughs> like, sorry about that. It was great. But oh well. <laughs> all right. Uh, let's see. When we checked in last, I believe our good friend Paul Kennel from the Auto Kramers, uh, it was his birthday, and I think they were going out of town. Um, I believe uh, <laughs> Punch, I forget what it is, but Jennifer Kramer. Uh, I believe she took uh, Paul Kramer out of town for uh, the 50th birthday, I it believe. It was 50? I think it was 50. I didn't realize that, you but that's fantastic. what all of the things said. Paul it doesn't sound right to me because I thought we were closer in age, but whatever. Um, more importantly, they didn't take many car videos because they're out there having fun as a couple, which makes me very, very happy. They sent just one, and I'm going to roll it for you right now. Check it in behind the orange curtain, except we're somewhere on the road. Roll it, hell. My name's Paul. 
but sometimes they call me Bill. I don't know why. <laughs> Wow, I laughed so hard. <laughs> Everybody can see. Oh my goodness. Good stuff. Oh, the kennels. You guys All right, are let's awesome. that was Orange County somewhere. Actually, I'm not sure where they are. I think they went up north, but over here in California somewhere. Let us go east and check in with the East Coast feed over okay. with the Kazman, Danbury Chive, probably Brooke Piece of Quiche, and let's see who else they're with. Checking in with the East Coast feed. Roll it out. Now this is a story. Jay Nicole, Brooke, Kazman, Blackheart, yes, yes, Tana Dane, Yorick. Yeah. Woo. Yep. We have a mini ASAP reunion in the household. We got pizza from Soho. Okay. Yeah, you it's, see that? It's the good stuff. Yeah, it's got pork on it. It's got pork on it. We got bacon. You know, it's a Saturday night. She got a quick little Venom shirt on because she's a big fan. I brought it back to 1984 Transformers. That's how we do it. So give me some random love for Jay and Nicole. Say hi. Good. All right. What up? What up? What up? That was it. That's our Saturday night. We want to love you guys. We home. This is what we do. There. Like I'm out. Yeah. See you later. Bye bye. <laughs> cool. Uh, that was the guys that were he was with was the, they're a the band from I think Poughkeepsie, but Kaz used to produce their records back in the day. No oh. joke. Uh, ASAP. Oh. Yeah. Uh, I like Poughkeepsie. It's a nice place. More than that, I noticed that they were having pizza in Connecticut with pulled pork on it. Now I'm not knocking that. That's one of our favorite things when we go to Hawaii: the Kalua pork on the mm-hmm. at Pizzetta, etc. Even I think Brick Oven Pizza does it. Um, but I didn't know it made its way. I mean, like Hawaiian pizza was making its way back east last time I checked, and they were just beginning to tolerate it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and it was only 50-50. Yeah. So this one's a little bit more of a stretch, but I like it. I'm excited. I'm stoked for them. Yeah. yeah. That's exciting to know it's so close. Well, you, yeah, you know what I'm saying, right? It's like kind of, oh, it's going to make its way. Because that's mm-hmm. re- it's really good. That's the other. It's, it it's sounds so disgusting, good. and it probably is. It is disgusting. I mean, not probably. Man, is it good. <laughs> So good. Sometimes we we're always in Hawaii too when we have it, so obviously the, the emotions are high and everything's good. The Sometimes vibes are Sometimes it's all you want though, and I kind of thought about those nachos the other day. Same thing, the Kahlua pork nachos. Oh so my gosh, good. I don't have a favorite on that one on Kauai. Mm-hmm. Brennikis is up there um, just because we love them so much, and I think they load up. That's they load true. Them up. So but anyway. we get them everywhere we go. They're so good. They are so good. Yeah, I know. I, <laughs> it's hard to find a favorite, isn't it? Even at the Hyatt, they're great at the, at the captain's bar. I know. The Grand Hyatt. Ridiculous. All right, Mrs. Ryan, uh, it's time to ask the question. Oh, do you have anything else? No. Oh, then it's time to ask the question that's on everyone's mind. What's going on, Mrs. Ryan? There is a new tech focus now. It went from it went from everyone personal and fingerprints and all this vo- the, all this nonsense and now they're going like oh it's not safe enough we need to get voice recognition and so oh that my. is the new focus of what everyone's looking at fine do your thing whatever but you should all so know that what they're doing is they're collecting the data because they're mining it for mental health uh, indicators and personality trait indicators and all that stuff. That's what it, yeah. Which is totally fine. It's all misdirection. Whatever they're asking for is not what they're going. Totally they're fine. Taking. Just be aware of what you're saying and how you're saying it. That's the crux of everything. I find it amazing the people who do all those quizzes and surveys on Facebook and then they're like, I don't know why all the, ad- I don't know why. You know. <laughs> Well, you've given everybody every detail so about your life and how I you like. think and how you operate. And I mean, it's <laughs> there's no mystery to it in my mind. Yeah, they've got you down in algorithms. All good. And because you did it. Nobody took anything from you. Right. You did it. Yeah, Just you were like, what they were doing. this is who I am. Yeah. Miserable. Zeros and ones. Uh, yeah. So be aware of what you're saying and who you're saying it to. That's the new voice recognition thing. Um, in eight states, I think all of this stuff is going to have people take more responsibility yeah. for themselves and their own words. Ultimate. I think at the end of the day, it's c- c- coming across to censorship right now because everybody's all over the place with every thought and everything com- turns into a word and a conversation when none of it necessarily needs to. I think I- ideally over time, you know, in a, a little bit right now, people, oh, I'm afraid to talk around my devices or whatever. I'm like, well, maybe that's good for a little bit, and then you relearn exactly what you need to say, and then just yeah. say that. It really and then you're, just, then you're then you're putting out what you mean, like all of your everything is aligned. <laughs> it's no so important. And like I honestly think it's just an, uh, we're just seeing more of what already exists. Nothing's new. Oh, for sure. So just yeah, it's just attention. Mi- be here. mindful of your words. Good for you. Heads up. 
Um, in eight states now, video games are now qualified as varsity sports. What? Yeah. Now, I got drawn on this article because it said you can get Letterman jackets. And, of course, I was misdirected to my oh, hero yeah. of white. Why Letterman, Letterman jacket? Sure. Um, but Connecticut's one of the states that this <laughs> is real. And this well, what are we talking about here? I mean, because in my mind, the sports is this physical activity and everything. But maybe that's not the case. They so what are they talking about? They practice and they go to tournaments. It's not physical, but it's, it's mental. But I you're mean, saying the state activity. recognizes it. Is this in school? It, it, it's a qualifier in states to go to college. What? Yes. You so I got into stuff. NYU because of Grand Theft Auto? Is that what we're talking I mean, yeah. it's a gross gen- Wow. Not only that, you can get them to pay for it. There are scholarships well, The truth available. is people make a lot of money doing these things professionally, so why wouldn't it become a thing? The numbers were crazy. astronomical that wow. they put out of like what you can get if you're good at sport, like all different kinds of games, whether it's sports or driving or like – Football, like all of the different sports and then like creative games, like how to build out, like who knows. Mm. Fascinating, but it's, it can be a sport now. It's pretty wild. It really is. I mean, it's, uh, there's so many, di- it's the matrix really, because it's another world. You're living in a virtual world. You're just, you're better living in that world than the guy next to you. You know what I mean? That's a weird thing, isn't it? As none of it's at, real. Yeah. yeah. It's still, there's still synapse going and it's still a learned thing. So I get that. Right? You know what I mean? One person's better mm-hmm. at it than another, depending on how much they do it or maybe whatever they're preconceived. It all comes down to how you control your space. Like, as an athlete, this, like, weirds me out because I'm like, wow, like, that's not the same as, like, what I did and trained and whatever. Do you still need to work on your breathing? And, like, is there are there still things to it? You yeah, know, I wonder. I think so because it's a very mental stimulation. Still competition, control. Right? Yeah, you have to – I've played some of those games because it helped me re put some of my brain together um yeah i did not say that correctly i almost said rhinoplasty but that's not right uh neuro neuroplasticity (laughs) neuroplasticity is the name of it but um it's it's a very mental exercise which is like meditation it's like driving it's so it really requires requires a lot of focus so good for them all right connecticut's one of them new york's thinking about it um Similarly, meditating youthens brain pieces. Oh. Uh-huh. So, uh, it, in the simplest of terms, gray matter is like padding for your brain, and it's mostly in the frontal lobe, which is the newest evolution of the brain parts. Okay. Meditate, and, and as you get older, the limbic system, like the older parts of your brain, like the earliest evolved pieces of our like human brains, they get older and they deteriorate. Sure. Um, so as you meditate, it gives you more gray matter, which is kind of like padding. And it lets you, it gives you space to think and grow and build and whatever. So meditating helps build and add gray matter, but it also shrinks some of the, the amygdala is what they saw mostly. But that's part of the limbic system that affects like inflammation and like spas of like fear it's what causes you to like be fearful and like constantly survey of like what's going on around you Mm. so meditation is what causes anxiety and stress um so it it shrinks oh right because it's the fight or flight thing right Mm -hmm. that's the limbic right sure okay yeah so it shrinks the older evolutionary parts of us that aren't as necessary in day-to-day life like there's no bear usually gonna eat you um, so it calms out, but a problem. it also just, it, so that's how meditation works. And like some, not, some people don't know because their inclination is, I don't know how to, I don't do it. I'm too busy. Yeah. Everyone, oh, how do you have time to meditate? It's like, why? how do you have time not to meditate? Holy smokes. Yeah. So that's how it works. If that helps at all, it helps me. It, it adds space to think and be creative and calm down. And it calms you down. So. I like that. That's I like the idea works. of creating space up yeah. here. Yeah. Thank you. Me too. And then lastly, All right. similarly, there's a lot of social confusion, confusion and judgmental curiosity about how hallucinogens work. Um, and pot, I, I get a lot. Like people don't understand like pot's a drug and it's a thing and it makes you just fun. It's fun. It makes, I laugh all the time anyway, so it doesn't help. I'm not the right spokesperson. But um, oh. Because your medicinal cannabis does not make you laugh. You laugh automatically anyway. I laugh right, anyway. Right, 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 and I right. really had to like trickle that out. Cause yeah, that's like, true because people would assume if they didn't know you, the ha ha ha, oh man, she's crazy high. And it's like, no, that, that was years before you ever even tried anything. That was how you were. Yeah, yeah. that's how I was. So MDMA basically. Didn't it, Jack Black tell you you laugh too loud? Yes. 
in Australia. <laughs> like so a, he told my boss <laughs> when we got back. He's like, she laughs too loud. I don't know about loud. her. She laughs too loud. Yeah. It's true. Um, yeah. I'm not always liked by comedians. It's kind of great. But some <laughs> love me. Um, but what this drug kind of light is being shined on things, MDMA basically, ju- it, it reactivates an evolutionary part of the brain that shuts down after adolescence i would like to have an expert on this mdma come on the show at some okay. point and talk about it because this comes up all the time and i don't know much about it other than what i've seen read blah 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 but i don't know anyone i've never had a one-on-one ex- uh, conversation with somebody who's actually had the experiences and done it like a joe rogan i'm hoping i don't want to cu- i'm sorry i cut you off but i'm hoping that this is very interesting to me i'm hoping we can maybe you can help me find somebody who would be good to talk about that with on the show I want it seems to. like you're into it too. And I'm super into it. I've here. my brother d- d- experimented that down that path. Of whereas I'm going the mar- the medical marijuana route because they work similarly. But basically, it just the so unlock I, is the idea, right? That unlock. it unlocks stuff. It unlocks in like all these different kinds of new ways of thinking about things. Meditation included. They just they activate and unlock and reopen certain parts of your brain that evolutionarily are set up to shut down at a certain point. Like social learning after adolescence isn't a skill that you necessarily need all the time. I always zoom out and I think of like however we were made was the recipe is long before however we've been decided to be served. Yeah. Lately. You know what I mean? In the last X amount, 100 years or whatever, however our parents and their parents and whatever the parents, that's not necessarily what was originally intended. Right. Yeah. So all these. So, so if, you, if you can let go of that thinking, then woof, the world's your oyster. Anything is possible. That's the trick. Is letting go of the science thinking. fiction guy here today. It'll be very interesting to have these conversations. Yeah. So just if, if again, if that helps, like, compar- like make it comprehensible into anyone. Comprehensible. That that's the word. How things work, then that's help me. So. And that's been what's going. On? And that's been what's going on, Mr. Dun 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 dun. Uh, Mrs. Ryan, you're the greatest. Uh, let us take a quick break. When we come back here, we're going to have Mark Scott <laughs> Zickery. 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 Gosh, I keep wanting to make it more than it is, and I'm sorry about that. We're going we're gonna to talk about everything he really is when he gets in here. When we come back, right after the break, sitting right there in that chair, Mark Scott Zickery. Yes. More to come right after this.
Officially, we are back. Yay. We are back. Hello, Mark. How are you doing? Hello, I'm good. Welcome, Life is welcome. exciting. We're Thank s- you. We're sitting here with Mark Scott Zickery. Zickery. <laughs> because it's very easy to pronounce. For some reason, I had Mark Zickery down, and then I added your middle name because I saw it was on IMDb and then everywhere yeah, else. I'm go. assuming it's maybe a union thing. Is that how well, that came f- about? Well, the funny thing is because uh, in my teens, I was practicing my writer's name, and I took a poll of people, and they said Mark Scott Zickery sounded like a writer. So... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, but the interesting thing is I once asked my mom, both my parents were married four times, and I, oh they were, I was from their first marriage, their only child from the first marriage. So I said to my mom, why did you name me Mark with a C instead of a K? And she said, well, if you look at Zikri, it's a tall capital letter and all small letters with nothing sticking up or sticking down. So M-A-R-C is the same way. And I said, well, what about Scott in the middle with those two Ts? And she said, well, that's after an old boyfriend, <laughs> which she had not told my father. <laughs> So it's like, okay, perfect, perfect, perfect. So, um, yep, yep, yep. So. I love the idea of the, mm-hmm. uh, uh, visually stimulating the, the, the idea of the, uh, the, that matching. I mean, the, yeah. you know, yes. I do things that way with yes. fonts and house industries and stuff. Yeah. Um, I, I'm fascinated that you're here. I'm fascinated by your career. Thanks. I'm a poet. I don't know it. There's all sorts of more <laughs> things you're going to figure out about me. I feel like maybe the best way to yeah. start is to tell you that I'm, I don't know much about science fiction. That's great. And I want to know what makes something science fiction. What makes science fiction? Is the that okay? Yeah, sure. Um, there's a lot of different definitions. Uh, one of my teachers, Damon Knight, who's the guy who came up with uh, uh, To Serve Man, which was made into a great love, Twilight it's my, one of my fa- It's a cookbook. Yeah. It's a yeah. cookbook. He it's was, one of my favorites. Well, he was a science fiction writer and a critic. And uh, he said his definition of science fiction is science fiction is what I'm pointing at when I say science fiction. And I thought that was a pretty, <laughs> pretty good one. But um, but realistically, science fiction is just you know you're extrapolating from the present to a future or or utilizing technology or it's 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 sort of whatever works you know I mean okay science so it's maybe a broader term than I yeah. realized I mean the real difference between fantasy and science fiction is that science fiction gives a technological or a pseudo technological explanation for what the fantastic element is whereas fantasy doesn't they it just has magic and that's that Harry Potter you know so. would Lord of the Rings be fantasy of course yeah yeah sure. yeah yeah. yeah. But, and um, Game of Thrones, fantasy. Yes, yes, absolutely. But Star Trek. Star Trek, Star, Star Wars. Star Wars is on the bubble because okay. it sort of has magic as well as, you know, technology. Oh, because of the Force. And the and lightsabers and all that. It's, oh, yeah, it's that's kind a of, one. it's yeah, and it's a long, long time ago in a galaxy far that away. But the like guy is future. still, yeah, but this guy's still named Luke, you know, so it's, <laughs> like, it's a little dicey. It's a little dicey. <laughs> but, you think it should be Lucas? <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy, that never occurred to me, by the way. Yeah. Is that why he's Luke? <laughs> yeah, it is. Is it I'm, really? Well, the, again, after George Lucas? The, 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 Every great piece of... I mean, I feel like of, an idiot. I don't well, know much yeah. about Star Wars either. Well, every, every great piece of writing has to have a truth at its center for it to work and resonate. And George Lucas grew up in Modesto, and he felt that he, was, that he wanted a grand life of, of, of adventure and excitement and fame, and he felt that the world was just passing him by there in Modesto. And so he c- extrapolated that to a fantasy setting wow. and made Luke Skywalker his... You know, so they made the, yeah. basically the Modesto is the planet, right. the desert planet well, that, uh, yeah. that Luke lives on. Well, and that's his wow. alter ego, kind of? Yes, yes, exactly. And so I it became that. a science fiction version of his uh, You might life. make me a fan right. out of all this yeah. stuff yeah. after <laughs> today. But that's why it resonates. That's why it works. Because it's it real. has, there's a truth, yes. And science fiction definitely appeals to people who feel like outcasts, people who feel a need for escape. But also you want it to resonate with your life and teach you lessons. Star Trek certainly taught a lot of people to be kinder and to have more um, connected lives in many, many ways. Is it all right with you if I jump all over the place? Of course. It, this probably won't be very fluid. No, no, but no, no, you just no, no, said no. something that is literally a note on my card. Sure, of course. I'm um, glad you have notes. I'd like to bring up some of your deep past stuff, of if course. that's okay, because Anything. it also coincides with my childhood. Nothing's off the table. You wrote on the Smurfs. I did. I the did. original Smurfs. Yes. Hanna-Barbera. Right. Yes, 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 I did. I wrote, I wrote the it Smurfs t- is where I yes. learned the difference between, I mean, combined with Mr. Rogers and Sesame yes. Street, is where I learned the difference between good and bad. Yes. Well, I'm the only writer who wrote for both Smurfs and Friday the 13th, the series. And what they had <laughs> I in love com- that too, by the way. Yes. That's the thing. <laughs> and what they had in common. No Jason in Friday the but, 13th, But they actually the had more in common than you think, because in both shows, the most common phrase that anyone said was, oh no. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> so well, it uh, showed you, but the yeah. Smurfs, there was, there was constant fear yeah. and teamwork yeah. and all yeah. of the fundamentals that, that would make somebody a Well, yes, and it was, it was great. It was fun. The characters were very distinctive. And, um, you know, it was, it was funny because I never actually, some animation writers grew up watching cartoons and wanting to write cartoons, and it was their, the love of their life. They, they could talk to Chuck Jones and Tex Avery backwards and forwards and all that <laughs> stuff. And, uh, but I wasn't one of those guys. I mean, I liked, I liked the Warner Brothers Looney Tunes, but I wanted to be a science fiction writer working on Star Trek and those kind of shows 
those. But um, when I was a teenager, I met a young writer named Michael Reeves, and he was writing animation, and he brought me in initially as a collaborator, and that was very obvious I could write them on my own. And so the first uh, animated script I wrote was for Space Ghost, and then I wrote for Smurfs and He-Man and Super Friends and Real S Ghostbusters and Space all Space Ghost on. Coast to Coast, the talk show? No, it was, this was the earlier version where Space Ghost was actually a, a superhero in space. Oh, wow. I always yeah. wonder where he came from. I didn't did. realize that. Yeah, no, he had, he had a, yeah, absolutely great costume. All right, well, then maybe jumping just slightly ahead yeah. from the Smurfs, another show sure. that was very, very big to me because yeah. I love the franchise. Sure. You may already know what I'm going to talk about. Yeah. The Real Ghostbusters. Yes, it was a great show. And that taught me how to use my imagination, and it taught me to expand what's possible. Yes. Well, the fun part was, you know, I wrote a bunch of those, and uh, the fun part was that the, the the movie wasn't even on home video yet, and we all loved the movie. So they actually sent us a, a VHS ca video cassette of the movie so we could watch it, and we all agreed to get the beats, like to get to, to the characters. Get the, yeah, the character voice, the the, the sensibility. Okay. And and one of the lovely things was uh, Joe Straczynski, who was a friend of mine. Uh, he story edited the show and he said to us we were all, all the writers he said I want this to be written just like it's a sequel to the movie so you don't write down to the audience it's not a kid show quote unquote you just, and so I was did writing did you ever see the cartoon the real Ghostbusters mm -hmm. it was fun it I was loved fantastic it. Yeah. Yeah. I had a it younger was brother who was like three years younger than me and yes. so we, I watched a lot of the stuff he yeah. loved and that was one of them it was fun it was fun and so I was writing social satire and I wrote one called um, Station Identification where all these characters come out of the television and uh, so I created a character who was a, a jam up of uh, uh, Rambo and and Gumby and I called him, <laughs> him Gumbo and uh, it, was, it was just fun it was really fun I remember so, I mean I, that was my childhood for sure mm, and yeah. I was so into the franchise yeah. I mean I didn't want to tell you how into but yes. I ended up building the car <laughs> and the whole bit sure yeah but Done of course, things but with Dan Aykroyd and the whole bit. Yeah, but see, at that time, I wasn't much older than the kids I was writing for. I was in my early 20s. That's what I was going to yeah. ask you. How old were you at that point? Yeah, well, I, I sold my first short story at 19. I had my first radio play on the air when I was 18 on KPFK. So and, you're already uh, writing before mm -hmm. you yeah. had all these things. And I was an art major at UCLA, and so I had gallery shows of my stuff when I was a teenager. And then uh, I broke into TV. When, oh, I started writing The Twilight Zone Companion when I was 22. <gasps> and I and I got into TV by the time I was 22 or 23 and had a really great run writing for all the studios and networks. It was fun. The original Twilight Zone, you mentioned The Outer Limits yeah. before. Um, there's another one that's it's escaping me right now, but yeah. my friend Jeannot used to direct on as well. Yeah, uh, Night Gallery. Night Gallery, yeah, exactly. Jean Do you know Jeannot's Vark? Of course. Do you really? Oh, sure. I mean, who doesn't? I, 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 he's, <laughs> no one ever seems to. <laughs> we used to be very close. He's yeah. a wonderful man. We used yeah. to work together a lot, and I, now I haven't seen him in a long time, but well, yeah. still correspond. Sure. Um, Jaws 2, yeah. <laughs> Jaws yeah. 2 for you. Yeah. Supergirl, <laughs> Somewhere in Time, a lot of wonderful things, and a lot of television yes. since. Somewhere in Time Time's a great movie. Um, yeah. uh, gosh, I don't even remember how that came about. But the, Night the, Gallery. The, we were talking the, Night Gallery. All of yeah. those shows, I caught mm -hmm. them on the Nick at Night and on, yes. the, on the rerun stuff, yes. but they still were as influential as, yeah. say, the real Ghostbusters. You bet. They went somewhere. Else. The real Ghostbusters it was a very, very. I don't want to make the whole show about that, but it was a very, very interesting. It. I remember one specifically yeah. where they go to the other side. Mm -hmm. yeah. They go to. They go through the containment unit into yes. past the wall. That's remember fun. in the movie, that's you know, fun. that's yeah. a big Twinkie. Yeah. You get to go into <laughs> where all the ghosts are stored. Yeah. That remember, Dickless shuts the power oh, grid off and it all yeah. goes up. Okay. Well, you see who's there. It's a different. It's not just the other side of the wall. It's a different world. Wow. That's fun. It yeah. was very, oh, cool. very fascinating. Cool. Yeah. It was very, very fascinating. And again, it showed the kids yes. get outside the box. That's right. Yeah, well, we were we were really pretty subversive. The, the, I mean, all of us who were writing for those animated shows, we, for, first of all, uh, when I came into animation, animation writers didn't have agents. So my friend Michael Reeves, who brought me in, he got an agent. He was the first animation writer to have an agent. And then Candice Montero, Candy Montero, basically got a lock on all of the animation writers. So we all knew each other. We'd all hang out. We'd, have, we'd go to parties together. Um, we were all in our, like, 20s and early 30s at the latest. And so we, and we were writing... We were very ambitious, and we were writing short stories and novels and writing for TV, and it was and, and we'd all kind of um, um, run stories by each other and all of that. It was a very um, collegial atmosphere, mm. so it was a lot of fun. Gosh, that's so neat. And then I remember hearing, anyway, I don't know if this is true, but the animation was actually done overseas or somewhere else. It was yes, not yes. The the writing and talent was yeah, here, I think. It, yes, but it, I mean, it, it, when I was in at the very end of Ink and Paint, where they were actually drawing it on cells and animating those, and Hanna-Barbera, I think, was the last studio that was doing the animation here, and then Filmation started farming it out to Asia. Yeah. yeah but Just part of the... Just 
transition? Yeah, but it was still great fun. And and again, we were um, like, where we, were you doing that? What is an animate? What is where is? What was this? it like? Yeah, I came up through yeah. live action, so I know a production office. Yes. I know where the set yes. is, all that stuff. But you guys are in we a were, writing room we, with no, a voiceover. No, booth no, or no, we were freelancers, and so oh, for the wow. most part, I mean, ever, some people were on staff. If you were a story editor, you'd be on staff. But but as freelancers, we were writing for multiple shows simultaneously. So one a given week, I might be coming up with a premise for real Ghostbusters and working on an outline for Smurfs and coming up with it and writing a script for He-Man so or did whatever. you work from home then? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh gosh, and, what and, a wonderful... Yeah, and sometimes I'd go to like a, a coffee house or, or UCLA's library to, to work and, and then... Uh, but, but the world is your office. Yeah, yeah, and you could earn extremely good money very, very quickly and uh, so... Um, and But I wanted to make the, the leap to live action and so basically at one point... Um, I earned enough for the entire year. I could earn about a hundred thousand in three months, and uh, and I told all of my employers that I was done for that period to write my my live action spec screenplay, and they started calling me with offers. I had to turn down two hundred thousand dollars of work oh. in two days, and that ruined your writing day. So that's when I would go to UCLA. This is before cell phones. It they does ruin your writing day. Your creativity yeah, shot. Right. <laughs> so I went. So I went to UCLA, and I, I would write there, and I took a writing class just to give me deadlines. And that script, oh. uh, I wrote this, this script called Piece of Cake, and it, it sold, and it got me a pilot deal with NBC, and then I was off and running in live action. So that was how that went. All right. Well, then I'm going to skip a fo- uh, forward a little bit further. Then um, <laughs> we're going to go to live action now. If you'd like, sliders. Yes. Yes. Sliders was... again, incredibly influential show yes. on my generation. Right. I don't know. I wouldn't. I don't want to put it up there with Back to the Future. Maybe Quantum Leap parallels. Yeah. 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 Um, but essentially alternate uh, universes, alternate realities, alternate yes. things, and we're going to more. I don't sliders know. was great. It was with it's a uh, fun show. Uh, Mr. Jer- Jerry O'Connell. Jerry O'Connell, yeah. And uh, uh, from uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark, the fantastic, uh, th- another three names. John Reese Davies. John Reese Davies. Yeah. Oh. Uh, I'm trying to think. There was a. It was a five, five people, I think. Yeah, it, it ran. It ran three seasons on Fox, and then Fox canceled it, and Sci-Fi picked it up. And That's I was right. hired as a producer on the fourth season. Uh, there'd been a lot of chaos in the third season um, behind the scenes, and they hired me to kind of reinvent the show. Was there a and cast bring a, changeover? To yes, you? John Reese Davies left, yeah. and um, but but it was fa- it was really fun because I uh, I'd been writing a lot of stuff by then, and. Um, they want and I and I was a science fiction guy, so I wanted it to live up to the to the great possibility of its premise. So because they'd been ripping off movies and all these things that were not not useful, and so I said, well, we're not going to rip off movies anymore. We're going to come up with things that are original. At and, one point, they were just yeah doing it was like the old days of uh, yeah. of, of Knight Rider and Airwolf. It was just anywhere on the Universal backlot we could shoot. Yes, There's yes, one episode that's yes. done in the back backdraft ride. Yes, <laughs> except yes. it's not the backdraft ride. It's some oh. well, the fun, <laughs> well, the fun part of that was so I was the I was the writer producer for the f- entire fourth season, and uh, and so my name's on every one of those. And but it was it was it, the, the, that was the season the show moved down from Canada to the Universal backlot, and I love backlots, and because well, you know Twilight Zone was shot in the, the Metro. You grew up lot. with it the same way yeah, I did. Yeah, right? I, I grew up in L.A., so I was I went to the oh. MGM auction when I was a kid, and uh, oh, yeah, so so that. when when we were on the Universal lot shooting sliders. Uh, our standing sets were on stage three, but Time Cop, the TV show Time Cop, was shooting on the next soundstage over, and it was canceled, and they were going to te- tear down those sets. So I went on to those sets and came up with an episode called Slide Cage for sliders that could use those sets. So, so I went back to the don't office. Strike it. I, right, I said to my assistant, tell him not to strike it. So we got a half million dollar set for free. And the fr- actually, the first question I asked when I was hired, because Rod Sterling said. And wrote, it's not even a location, right? Because right, you're staying on the lot. Right, right. Oh my God. No, because, because Twilight Zone, because I researched Twilight Zone. I wrote the Twilight Zone Companion starting when I was 22 to learn how to write and produce TV. That was my goal. And Rod Serling shot Twilight Zone at MGM. He had access to every prop, every set, every costume ever made for any MGM TV show or movie. Just the archives so were available. They were using stuff from, for lots of stuff from Forbidden Planet. They were using stuff from the Andy Hardy Street. They were shooting where Meet Me on the, in St. Louis was shot. And... Um, Wow. So when I was hired on Sliders, the first question I asked was, do we have access to every set, prop, and costume from Universal? And our line producer said, huh, that's an interesting question. No one's ever asked that. So he said, well, I'll find out. So he came <laughs> Not back. Not since Glenn A. Larson. Yeah, but he came back and he said, with, with very few exceptions, the answer is yes. So we were using stuff from 12 Monkeys and Jurassic Park and, wow. and so forth. It gave anything that was going on at yeah. the time. And so it gave us huge, um, it expanded our possibility, our production uh, budget, you know, so we were Versus able to do a lot more. Versus just a stage in Vancouver. Yeah, and so it was, it was hugely fun. 
fun. And dealing with parallel worlds, I was able to put in a lot of in jokes. Like at one point, they, uh, one episode, they're coming out of a movie. They're in a parallel Earth. They're coming out they're of a sliders. movie. They're sliding between yes. these different different gener- yeah. different timelines. And so um, they've just seen um, the man who would ke- be king, starring Humphrey Bogart and Clark Gable, which was a film John Huston wanted to make, but then uh, Humphrey Bogart died and he wasn't able to make it. So in this so parallel in this Earth, reality, it they, they just come and they come out talking about that movie. He ultimately made the movie with Sean Connery and Michael Caine decades later, and then they slide to another Earth where the marquee is the Wizard of Oz w, starring W.C. Fields and Shirley Temple. And again, Whoa. that was the cast they initially tried to get. And so it was very fun to have those little little tips of the hat. Nods you know? for you. Yeah, yeah, because I'm such a cineast, you know. So, um, yeah, it was fun. Great fun. Great, great that fun. That sounds like the perfect marriage you getting to write stuff like yeah. that. Yeah, but also because, because Fox had kind of run the show into the ground, uh, the first thing we did was we met with our actors one-on-one, and we said, what do you think's working? What do you think's not? And they told us. And then I was... This is the, all you? This yeah. is your... Oh, yeah. And, and the other producers on the show. You are. And then And then we went to the World Science Fiction Convention. We had a, a meeting with the Sliders fans. Now, online, everyone was saying, kill the show. We hate the show. You know, blah, blah, blah. And because I, it had, it had yeah, changed. It, it was not what it used to be. it had gone downhill, yeah. Right. And so I said to the fans what do you like about the show and what do you hate about the show? And they told us what they hated about the show and I said, we agree and we're going to fix it yeah. and so give us a chance. And so the premiere of the fourth season got the highest rating in the history of the Sci-Fi Channel of anything they'd ever aired. And so the fans came back and um, because week after week it was exciting, it was varied, the actors were engaged because we were writing shows that showed the potential of the show. Right. And it was hugely fun and uh, so that was, I really loved doing that. It was, it was great. Well, I, I love being on a, on a studio a lot. I loved being on at Paramount, all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. well, all right, that's, you are king of the segue. It's incredible. <laughs> it's like you saw what I was writing um you brought up the mgm auction yes i'd like to go back to the paramount auction because yes. you have history with star trek sure yes uh i used to work on the tv show everybody hates chris really? we were the very first show hmm. to occupy the property and wardrobe building after they yeah. gutted it and made yeah. it offices yeah yeah, yeah. We're the very first people in yeah do you remember all of that? Do you remember sure. the truckloads of yeah. Star Trek props and wardrobe and everything? I mean, containers yes. full yeah. that they were just, I don't even, I think they hauled that shit to the dump. I don't yeah. even know where a lot of it went. They, I think they, most of it literally got thrown out. They sold a lot of the, co- they sold a lot of the Star Trek costumes to It's a Wrap, which is a, a company that sells like t- uh, f- uh, wardrobe from new movies and TV shows. Right. Uh, you know, it, it, it finds its way one way or another in various places, but... Uh, the but, wardrobe maybe, but, but I mean, a lot some of those the history old props gets, that look like garbage because yeah, they're so lot, beat up to yeah. someone like you or me might right. have been like, oh, that's from... Well, yeah, well, I'm a huge fan of Blade Runner, and a friend of mine built the city in Blade Runner, so I said to him, if you could give me anything from Blade Runner, even a little piece of nothing, yeah. it would be like the true cross to me. So he gave me part of the city, so I've got that at home. A and miniature. It's, it's this brass cutout of a sky, a futuristic skyline, and they made a whole bunch of those and stacked them and then illuminated them and did all sorts of things, and so I have Movie that magic. now. Where do you and for keep me, it? It's, it's in, it's in the, our place. It's, you know, I'm gonna, eventually I'm going to frame it, but now it's just sort of sitting on a counter. So and, cool to have. Yeah, but, it's, but again, it's sort of like... Um, you know, they throw stuff out and they don't care. And when I wrote The Twilight Zone Companion, I was amazed the CBS didn't, hadn't even held on to their publicity stills. And it was, it was shocking, you know. It's funny. I've got tape over saying what it is, but there's a, a digital slate behind you on the wall that <laughs> is actually from Enterprise. Wow. Because it was just being That's thrown great. out. I said, oh, I've always wanted wow. like a digital slate just to, just yeah. to whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's well, I love that. just well, odd. But, uh, but I always loved this stuff. It was always, always magical to me. And I remember when I was a kid, you know, the original Star Trek came on. I was 10. and uh, the, I, original, I, the original, original Star original, Trek. The original. And this is back before VCRs, before any of that stuff. So a show aired. You had to watch it when it aired. And then it was gone. And so I, rec- I as a little kid, I recorded Star Trek on reel-to-reel audio tape in case it never aired again. And, no uh, way. And I was re- being raised by a divorced mom, a single mom, and one of her boyfriends was in showbiz. <laughs> one, of her bo- one of her boyfriends had been one of the Bowery Boys in the movies, <gasps> and he was later a comedian. He had his own TV show in the 50s. He was a protege of uh, Milton Berle, and he knew I was a Star Trek fan. Are you going to say the name at some point? His name was Eddie Leroy. Okay. And so he... And, uh, he uh, and one day he said, get in the car, I've got a surprise for you. And he drove me to this apartment, and we knocked on the door, and Nichelle Nichols opened the door. Oh. And she, she was, and that was when Star Trek was on the air. So she was playing Uhura at the time. This is uh, the, the, the right. only woman, I right. guess. Yeah. And so I, uh, she ushered me in, and she gave me a signed photograph of herself as Uhura and one of her own scripts from Star Trek. And, and this is during the time, and this so is, she's young, she's beautiful, and, and everything. Right. And this is, this is not a Xerox. This is Mimeo. It has the blue production pages. Mm-hmm. It has all the Uhura lines of circle because that's how she would learn her lines. And I was, I was smart little kid at 10 and I said do you have any more of these and she reached into her wastebasket and pulled out five more scripts from five other episodes <laughs> and gave them to me so I have these in my collection still and uh, and the great part is that and I'm you're fr- in her apartment yeah I mean, 
mean, this is incredible. It was magic. And and so so on Friday, we're shooting a scene with her for Space Command, which is this project I'm shooting now. And to have it all come full circle. Yes, this is this week. Uh, In a few days, we're shooting a scene with her for this big science fiction series I've been shooting. And uh, and so to come full circle all these years later is just a dream come true. And uh, have you seen her between then and? Well, it was funny because at uh, does she know this story? I guess is yes, she does. And at at Comic Con, we've had a, a Space Command booth at Comic Con for several years. And uh, and I got a phone call from from a friend of mine who was a writer on Star Trek: The Next Generation. He said, "I have a big favor to ask." I said, "What is it?" He said, "Nichelle Nichols needs a place to sign photos of herself at Comic Con, and I want to see if we would u- if we could use your booth." And I said, "Of course." Yes. And so she was there, and one of our stars, Doug Jones, who's now in Star Trek: Discovery, was there. He was the creature in Shape of Water, and. Uh, and so they were there with me, and it was just a, it was a dream come true. And that's when I started the idea of I want to I want to write a scene for her and, and shoot a scene with her. And it took all these months, but now it's come to fruition. And and you know it was amazing because I, I there was a letter she wrote me after that visit. I wrote her a thank you note, and she wrote me this wonderful letter back, which I hadn't even read since I was ten. And recently on Mr. Sci-Fi on my YouTube channel, I read that aloud to raise the money to be able to shoot the scene with her. Mm. And by the next day, I had the money I needed to shoot the scene. And uh, and in the letter, she's talking about Gene Roddenberry and and Theodore. Stern who was a writer who later became my mentor when I was a teenager. He was a writer for Star Trek. And, uh, and a little later, I got to go on the Star Trek set. I was there for the last episode of Star Trek they ever shot, Turn About Intruder, Intruder, and that was... The original series. Uh-huh, the last episode ever. I got to sit in the captain's chair and stand on the transporter and see the little screw and light bulb they had above in the, in the transporder. Unbelievable. And, uh, and the fascinating thing was that they were shooting a scene in Sick Bay with Nurse Chapel, who was Major Barrett, who later married Gene Roddenberry. And one of the stagehands said last show of the season and Major Barrett under her uh, oh, un, you know just Soto Voce season. said last show ever yeah. and the irony was that years later I did a Star Trek episode with George Decay uh, and she was the computer voice in that episode so 40 years later I got to record her for that and so it was just are amazing. all of these moments I mean just yeah the payoffs for life, right? Yes, They sure. really are. They're, oh, they're yeah. the results of the, doing the work. Well, being able to work with the actors you love, being able to be mentored by the writers who've shaped you. I mean, if not for Twilight Zone and Star Trek and Outer Limits, the original versions of those shows, I wouldn't be a writer. I wouldn't be sitting here. And um, and they gave me that, the, the and a number of the writers, Harlan Ellison particularly, who wrote City on the Edge of Forever for Star Trek, he said, you must not waste your, time, your audience's time. You must tell them a story that's... F- from your heart that's truthful, that's never been seen before. Mm. So you can't just be giving them what's easy or what's or what's convenient or an easy sale. And so I always push myself to bring my A-game to everything, whether it's Smurfs or, or, or Space Command, which I'm doing now, or any of the things I do. It's always my A-game. Uh, my friend Frank Spotnitz, who... Uh, uh, created Man in the High Castle. He said, "You always have to aim for the fences because maybe then you'll get a single." But you always aim for the fences, and I wow. agree. And he also said, "Good enough is never good enough," and I agree with that too. I love the, the just the logic to it. Why yeah. would you swing for a single when you yeah. might not well, even get? Well, yeah, <laughs> because your your audience is millions of people. Why waste their time? Why waste your time? You know, I mean, that's where I get. Yeah, I mean, you know, you are you happy with what you're doing? Well, yes. Putting out there, well, you like the, end, the product? Well, yes. I mean, the lovely thing about the new world that we live in, I love the new media and everything. I love the internet. I love crowdfunding. I love all this stuff. I wouldn't go back to when I started when there were only three networks and PBS. I wouldn't go back there for for anything because now authenticity is what people prize. And the first writer I ever saw in person was Ray Bradbury, when I was, again, when I was seven, okay? And he spoke at a to library. To me, it's a building on the Paramount lot. Yeah, you know yeah, what I mean? Like, yeah, you knew yeah. him. That's amazing. Well, Ray Bradbury, he was, uh, Ray, I saw Ray Bradbury when I was 10. He spoke at a library, and I didn't just sit in the front row. I sat in front of the front row <laughs> on the carpet, looking up at this hero of mine, because I was reading science fiction as a kid. And he said something then that left a huge mark on me. And it was, he said, ideally, your life and your work and your art should all come from the same place. Mm. And it's like, wow. And it's all about authenticity. You know, your work be authentic, your life be authentic, your art be authentic. That's the alignment I was talking yes, about earlier. It's congruity. You it's have congruity. To have all the three things and, but, that, but see, now with crowdfunding and the internet and all of that, people, people can tell e- immediately who's full of shit and who's not. Right. You know, the and, worst part is the people well, yeah. who are spewing the shit have no idea. Everyone right. can see through no them. Idea. Right. But, but the thing is that <laughs> if, if you're authentic, then people will recognize that they're the same as you and they'll want to be part of your world and let you into their world. Yeah. And it's hugely meaningful to me. And I, I, you know, my audience has given me over a million dollars to shoot Space Command. And we're now in post on the two-hour pilot. This is a great time to talk about it. Tell us all about Space Command, because that was something you came up with. Sure, yes, it was. Um, As I said, I've I've written for all the major studios and networks and uh, hundreds of hours of TV and... uh, you know, very successful career. But what 
and I've been very lucky. Most of the executives I dealt with were smart. They weren't trying to wreck the show. Mm. You know, it wasn't, I didn't have to do end runs around these crazy notes, which well, so many of my friends do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that luck, though? Is well, that luck? Yes Did you were no. just at the right studios with the right execs? I find that that may it's, be... Um, well, I think if you're doing good work, it helps. Mm-hmm. If you, if you're on, if you, and also if you honor them. One of the rules that my wife and I have in every script we write is that no matter what the notes are, every draft has to be better than the previous one. No matter what, mm-hmm. so you have to find the way of getting the note to work, mm-hmm. you know, and so that that's very useful. But um, I just think to myself, yeah. you dealing with the executive, I'm just sitting across yeah. from you, having just met you today, yeah. and I can't imagine anyone not getting along with you. <laughs> if that makes sense, I'm that's sure that when you. you're working, I'm sure when yeah. you're working, there's a different a different headspace. Yeah. But yeah. Um, you seem to be a very gentle, well, very uh, warm, uh, very honest and authentic person. It's the love of a good woman in all yeah. of the. Th- <laughs> I know yeah. what that's like. Yeah. I yeah, yeah, that's yeah. Like. yeah. And then, in fact, that's a great segue to get us to that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but I, I feel like maybe perhaps you deserve a little bit more credit than you're giving yourself well, in well, this thanks. story. Well, thanks. I just want. I appreciate it. Now back to your story. But yeah. So, so um, uh, 26 years ago, I uh, my friends, a lot of my friends in Hollywood are feeling very beaten down, very depressed, very uh, just bummed out because Hollywood can be so corrosive. And I thought, well, I'm not just going to complain about it. I'm going to do something about it. So I created this round table of writers and directors and actors and producers and editors and composers and novelists, everyone, anyone in the game, tank. anyone in the game. And I said, okay, we're going to meet every Thursday at a restaurant and anyone with a good heart is welcome. And This it's, is ridiculous. Yeah. yeah. You're, he doesn't so know anything parallel. about us. He right. knows know. nothing right. about right, us. Right, right, right. And so I started with six people. And I said, it's going to be every Thursday, and we'll have an email component and a website, but, but some people have to come into one meeting in person to get the vibe, get it, the fact that it's supportive, that it's uh, um, positive, you know, and so forth. Yes. So it started with six people, and now it's thousands. And we have offshoots in New York and Dallas and Phoenix and Florida and, uh, and Wh- Atlanta. And what's New it called? New Mexico is called The Table. And the I run Table? It. I run it. And, um, and it's thrived. And so, um, so I, I run it every Thursday at a restaurant. And, and so is I started... Is it the same? Does it change? You no, know, it's it's the same restaurant. It's Great. it's in the uh, in the valley, and and so and there's no membership dues, no requirements. People just have to order food because it's a restaurant. Right. But and, and participate. And, right, and they can they, once they come to one meeting, they get on the email and reach out to all several thousand members. They can uh, access the website, and they can either come every week or come never, and it works. And um, so as a res- and the youngest member was eight. Her grandma brought her. She was an actress, and the oldest member's in his eighties. Wow. Okay? And everyone's treated with equal respect and equal kindness. And there's no judgment of who's deserving, who has talent. And, and someone who's an Oscar winner is treated with the same amount of respect as someone who's just gotten off the bus from Keokuk, you know, or wherever, <laughs> you know, or, 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 or landed from Tanz- Tanzania, you know. So, so you choose your reference. <laughs> so I mentor, yeah, so I mentor all these people and thousands of people, and I started hearing about crowdfunding, and that was very interesting to me, and I'd never raised money before. But I, came, but I was noticing a few but years meanwhile, ago, you can access yeah, people. You have yeah. the ability to do that. Yeah. Yes, interesting. And so, so there was, uh, so things kind of came together. Which was, I, um, I, I, a few years ago, science fiction was very dark and very dy- dystopic. You had movies like Elysium and After Earth, and you had uh, TV shows like Battlestar Galactica, which I thought was terrific, but very dark. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah. <laughs> and I wanted to do something that would be inspiring, like Star Trek had inspired me. And and I wanted to do something about a, a space going show. And um, uh, because when I was a kid. We expected to go, to land people on Mars. We expect to have that space station. I mean, when when I saw two thousand one, when I was a kid, we thought that that was what the future we were going to get. Yeah, for no, sure. Science fiction never predicted we would land on the moon and then stop. And <laughs> you know, I mean, you okay. know, and so you know, so, so true. So I wanted I wanted to do a, do a show that was like a, a hopeful vision of the future, not candy coated, not rose colored glasses, but just saying we'll have our challenges, but with compassion and bravery, we can come together, reach across boundaries and barriers, yeah. and create a future worth living in. And so, so a lot of my friends run network shows, and they said, well, why don't we partner up and we can get a pilot deal? But I knew that the, pi- the, the, the script could be cut off at script, it could be cut off at pilot, the networks would own it, and it would never see the light of day. And I, and, or they c- would give us notes or that it would wreck us. Or wouldn't be yours anymore, yeah. exactly. And so I thought, well, I've never raised money, but let's see if I can try. So I thought, okay. Let's, uh, our target was $75,000 to raise over two months. We raised that in three days, and we kept going, and we raised $221,000. And oh, that was okay. enough for me to open my own studio and roll camera on, on the two-hour pilot. And uh, my wife and I you know, wrote it, directed it, produced it, and uh, it starred Doug Jones from Shape of Water and Star Trek Discovery and Robert Picardo from Star Trek Voyager oh, and Stargate Atlantis. He's a great guy. He's wonderful. Nice man. And uh, Mira Furlan and Bill Mumy who, and Bruce Boxleitner, who I'd worked with on Babylon 5 when I wrote for that show. And, 
and 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 I was friends with Mike Harney from Orange Is the New Black, and he I was very funny. I was having dinner uh, lunch with him, and I noticed he looked like our hero that we cast. And uh, I said, "You wanna you wanna be in Space Command?" He said, "Yeah, sure." And I said, "Well, I can't pay your quote." He said, "Don't you know?" Mm. And and so all these people said yes. And then because it was financed by um, three thousand people around the world, I thought I remembered the. Uh, the uh, Gone with the Wind talent search, the Scarlett O'Hara talent search in 1939. And I thought, everyone in the world is paying for this. Why don't we have a talent search for two of the leads? Not a walk-on, not one line, but for two of the leads where anyone anywhere in the world can download the sides, shoot their own audition wow. for two of the leads. And so we got 7,000 inquiries, 1,200 videos. And uh, we ended up casting nine actors from those auditions. We had callbacks. And oh, not even the lead, just in general. For the leads, wow. for the leads. And oh, really? These are the leads, yes. And, and one, of the ca- one of the roles, Lieutenant Bradbury, was, um, could be a male or female. But Captain Kemmer... Uh, was a male, but one actress was bold enough to audition for that role, and so I had her come in, and she was great. So I created a female captain who had the sister ship of our hero ship, and she's one of our leads now too. And so again, it, it was very fun to have actors who were very famous and had millions of fans, and bring in these these newcomers who were very talented and give them a shot they never would have had. So our lead, wow. our lead Ethan McDowell is from Wyoming. Brian McClure, who ran, won the role of Lieutenant Bradbury, is from Iowa. And, um, and in fact, the scene with Nichelle Nichols, uh, uh, Ethan McDowell is going to fly in from Atlanta. I'm flying in from, in from Atlanta to be in the scene with Nichelle. And so, so because of the internet, because it's so permeable now, and one of my friends who was the showrunner on Walking Dead said, well, you know so much about science fiction, you should have your own YouTube channel. So I started a YouTube channel called Mr. Sci-Fi. So now I've put the first hour of Space Command on Mr. Sci-Fi, where anyone can watch it. And we've got oh, 95, 95% thumbs up. Uh, we're we're almost 150,000 views, and we're heading toward a million. So, wow. So You're incredible. It, yeah. So it's, again, so I'm So what else is yeah. on your channel? Well, I, I post w- I post about once a week about science fiction in general, so it could be... But is it you talking? Yeah. Is it a, oh, yeah. great. I, I wanted to make it super simple, because when I was a commentator on Morning Edition on National Public Radio, that was just me telling stories about my life, So and I wanted it to be simple. And so I didn't know with, about that, by with, the way. Yeah, well, I love NPR. Yeah, it was great. It was fun. While I was story editing shows, because I just spent a year writing a feature for New Line, and it was such a Megillah. And I wanted something simple where I could say, this is what happened to me and this is what I think it meant. So that's how I ended up with the gig on Morning Edition. sustainable Edition. too. Right. And so with, with Mr. Sci-Fi, with my YouTube channel, I wanted it to be simple. So I just take my, my iPhone, I turn it on myself, I talk for however long I want to mm-hmm. talk. It can be anywhere from four minutes to an hour. And then I just post it on my, my channel. And there's Gosh, almost... it's so easy. Right. Yes. And, um, and now I have like millions of views on my channel. Mm. And... Um, and so I can use that also to raise, raise money for Space Command because I, I raised money on Kickstarter, but also I sold investment shares, uh, a percentage of my producer's net profits on the first four episodes. And I made it a small amount of money, 7500 bucks. So, so some of our inve- my investors are truck drivers or martial arts teachers or people, and some are our, our software developers. I mean, it's anywhere, people wow. all around the world, you know, and... Um, is that it's, neat for you? I mean, do you, are, do you cool. ever take a moment to really oh, yeah. get the scale of that? It's such oh, yeah. an interesting thing. Oh, yeah, it's great. It's got great. a micro studio. Well, yeah, so one... Uh, with a global well, reach. <laughs> well, I'll tell, you, I'll, I'll tell you a great story. A few weeks ago, I was in London pitching Space Command to uh, Netflix, and I come out of the underground, out of the subway, uh, and a voice on the, on the sidewalk says behind me, Mark Zickery, Space Command. And I turn, and it's a guy who's seen me on my YouTube channel and is a Space Command fan, and he works for the BBC, and he recognized me in London, mm. on the street. That's so neat. Yeah, and so it's like, it's permeable now. You know, back when I started, um, you'd write a show, and the audience would see it, and maybe they'd write you a letter, or maybe you'd see some fans at a convention, and that was it. Now, I'm in communication with my fans every day. and wow. And there's a great story, I'll, I'll tell you. There was... Because uh, it takes longer when you're, self, when you're financing it this way. It's it's Because uh, Space Command, the first two hours, has 1,900 visual effects shots. And so the, ni- oh. the, the first hour that we've put out has uh, over 900. So it's a lot of heavy lifting. Wow. And, um, but fortunately, I, I love visual effects. But, and, but the characters are central. The characters and the relationships and who they care about and, and the fact that compassion is the driving force, that's what the show's about. But, um, but at one point... That taking, strikes me. That yeah. seems to be your core. But at one point, someone was, was emailing saying, well, you know, why is this taking so long? Yeah. And someone answered them. One of the fans answered and he said, he sent me a message. He said, Mark, we know you're doing a great job. Take, take the time you need to make it right, to do it right. And he said, and I don't say this lightly because I've, I've just entered hospice. So, mm. I, so I emailed him back and I said, does, does this mean what I think it means? And he said, yes, I've got terminal cancer. And I, he was in his 40s and he had a kid, a, a daughter and a wife. And I said, listen, here's what I'm going to do. 
I'm going to send you the rough cuts of the two hours we shot and the 40 minutes of the second one. And I'm going to send you those scripts so you, could, you can watch it with your family and you can enjoy it because there was no telling if he would be around when we were done. And, he said, and I, so I did that and he said, thanks so much. And he's still with us. He's still fighting. He's still in there. And, uh, and it's just, but it was so meaningful to me. And to be able to, to make it a two-way street where I could share this with him because I didn't let any of the public see any of our rough cuts or any of that of stuff because it's a green screen and all this nothing was done but I thought let's let's share that and someone was, at least had the story yes well it's, again it's it's that thing about congruity that we were talking earlier in my life I'm compassionate in my work I'm compassionate that's the that's what I'm writing about people who are compassionate because in these times you know what I, I don't want to get into politics but certainly in these times I try to be kinder than I normally would be mm-hmm. if someone's trying to get in a parking space and there's a garbage can blocking them I'll run across the street and move the garbage Absolutely. can I'll open doors for people I'll you know um, just say hello whatever one man you know. can make a difference well, I you, agree there's with a ripple you. effect kindness yes. has a ripple effect just like cruelty does yeah. and you know I mean you know my, my grandfather came here uh, and my mom was born here, and if he had stayed in his village, everyone else in his village in Poland was exterminated, in, including everyone else in his family. So my mother would have been exterminated, my mm. grandfather would have been exterminated, my aunt, my, my grandmother, everyone would have, I, I wouldn't be here. Yeah. So that's very real to me. And that was politics. That was letting someone get in power who used it for evil. Yeah. And I think we have to take a stand, and we have to reach out to others who are not like us. And if someone's different from you, smile at them, be friendly, you know, invite them to dinner, whatever it is. You know, we cannot live in our own little little frightened worlds. It's, it's, too, it's too costly. Simply uh, keeping your eyes up and smiling at a stranger is quite frankly one of the, the simple gifts in this well, world for me. Yeah. When, when they smile back, especially. Well, well, be human. Yeah. I mean, you know, and be kind. And, you know, it's, uh, but it's, it's a verb. Compassion is a verb you have to put into action. It's not something you can just feel inside and say, oh, I'm a nice person because I'm, I'm nice. No, what are you doing? Because I feel that not someone else is hurting? Yeah, what are, you, what are you doing in the real world, you know? It's that, you know, Gosh. so, yeah. Uh, well, we have something else in common in yeah. that we both um, uh, work with our wives yes. in every way yes. possible. Yes. Um, yeah. We spend every waking hour together, That's really. Great. That's I mean, great. You know, I mean, we, we obviously have our own little places where we work, well, but, sure. um, but we live and work together and play together. That's great. Uh, yeah. And yes, I wouldn't too, change too. it. You know the things that we deal with and the things yes. that we go through. Yes. Um, I wouldn't change it. No. Tell us about you. Well, you know, I met Elaine when I was 20. And that was that, you know, um, I, uh, I, I, I got, you know, I was the youngest of any of my friends to get married. So I got married when I was 21. Wow. And, and so my friends hadn't even gone through puberty. And, uh, <laughs> you know, and uh, it was very interesting because I was nervous about this, of course. And uh, because both my parents were married four times. And, uh, and so my dad, I went to my dad for advice and he said, well, you can always divorce her. <laughs> Great. And, and, what advice and, did you expect? And my, yeah, but my mom, my mom had a friend who was a Catholic counselor. And he was a good one. He wasn't a pederast. <laughs> and, uh, and he was a really, really, really good good-hearted guy so I drove down to Manhattan Beach to get his advice I was very worried that he would see into my secret soul and see my doubts and talk me out of getting married so he sat me down 20? yeah I was like 21 okay and uh and he he sat me down and he said do you love her and I said yes and he said then marry her and that was it Mm. and so on those two on those two pieces of advice you can always divorce her (laughs) you love her marry her I got married and um and Elaine was taking a big chance with me because I was just an art student. I, was, I just graduated college, and there was no telling if I would succeed in anything. Well, that's and, everybody at that yeah, age. Yeah. Unless she, she was 20 years older than and, you. But, she, but no, but, it was, uh, but she really backed me. And she, uh, The Twilight Zone Companion was rejected by 25 publishers before it sold. And over a two-year period, and I would have hung it up. I would have given it up. And she said, no, keep going. And uh, we, ch- we saw what was not working, which was it was the wrong agent, and we changed agents. And they went back to one of the publishers who'd rejected it to a different editor who could buy, and he bought it. And the, mov- the book was an instant success. It's been in print ever since, and it's sold over half a million copies. It's, ins- it's like Back to the Future. It's yeah. insane to me that anybody ever turned it down. Because, yeah. I mean, I don't know what the product yeah. was when that was happening. Yeah. Uh, well, it was, but it was, the whole concept yeah. to me is just yeah. brilliant, especially for that show. But it, it, this was like um, the late 70s, early 80s, and it would go to some old publisher, some old editor who would say, well, why would anyone buy a book about a TV show that's been off the <laughs> network for 15 years? Yeah. You're, You're confused get about it. your mediums. But finally it went to a young editor who had the power to buy and who had grown up with Twilight Zone. And he said, yeah, of course. And his name was Erwin Applebaum. He became a very big force in publishing. And, uh, and the book has been just, you know, I just came out with a new edition. Um, 
and uh, just a few weeks ago. Well, and so did the Twilight Zone. Yes, yes, so yes, how, yes. Should we talk about that? Or do you, I mean, you probably I don't did, have any involvement I just, there. I just did a review on Mr. Sci-Fi where oh, I talked good. about it for an hour. And and anyone who wants to subscribe to Mr. Sci-Fi can go on YouTube and Mr. Sci-Fi, Mark Zickrey, there you go. The only reason I haven't watched it yet is I'm dying to watch it with you, especially yes. because of the subject matter, yes. certainly for the first episode. Uh, okay. It's about yep. a comedian. Yeah. Um, so what do I think? <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, without it's, giving any spoilers away, if possible. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I love the original, as I yes, told you, but I also course. really liked the 80s the yeah, colorized I, I 80s for ones. That one. I you did? for that one yeah yeah oh man and, there's uh, i could pull out some of my favorites <laughs> <laughs> well it was amazing writing staff at harlan ellison george r, r. martin you know etc you're Bennett. kidding the guy Great. the game of thrones guy yeah he was on the writing staff the santa claus guy yeah. we met at comic-con <laughs> yeah i worked i worked with george on two shows on that and on the ron perlman beauty and the beast and i saw him recently the tv ha- show with yeah, uh, linda yeah. uh, wow. hamilton yes linda hamilton, right? yeah, yeah yeah and uh so i saw george recently at the world science fiction convention he invited me to a party we were hanging out it was fun and um but i mean we all know each other i mean it's like it's fun because we've been crafting the history of television over the last several decades but we all hang out we all know each other all the producers from Star Trek and Babylon 5 and the Orville and all these shows we all know we, all, every, everyone in science fiction knows everybody else wow. and, it's a and small I, yeah. little group yes. I mean not yeah. that you're it's no. a small group but you don't like it's, you're it's, not extroverts you're not we're, out we're at all, every party well we're all jazzed by the same thing which is creating yeah. something wonderful and the fact that we sh- it's like we share our work with millions of people around the world, and and it lasts for forever. Right. It'll outlast us. People will be watching Smurfs when I'm long gone. Yeah, you know. And I I once did a pilot for NBC in Thailand. And I went to my hotel room and turned on the TV. It was one of my Smurfs Smurfs episodes in Thai. You know, so it was like no way. that was yeah. Wow. And you know, that's cool. But um, but so but yeah, and so um, but so yeah. But I wrote uh, the script I wrote for Twilight Zone. A week before prep, the censors pulled the plug on it because it was too violent. Now it would be nothing. It was called Knife Through the Veil. And so was your episode not produced? Never produced. No kidding. And Doug Hayes, who was one of the great directors on the original Twilight Zone, he did Eye of the Beholder and, and um, uh, The After Hours and The Howling Man. He was going to direct it. He was a dear friend. Mm. But, if, but eventually I'll shoot that. I, you know, now that I, now That's that I what can, I'm seeing. You're a studio yeah. now. You well, can just yeah, do it. You know, now that I'm green lighting myself, I can do whatever the hell I want. And, um, you know, I'm, I mean, I'm beyond <laughs> space. He's a professional segue maker. Yeah, I mean, beyond, I mean so it's, it's fine. And then but you were asking about the new Twilight Zone. In short, just curious. I think I think Jordan Peele is is, is astonishingly talented. I loved Get Out. Rod Serling would have loved it. Um, I thought Us was very very interesting. I liked it. It, it has some fl- some flaws, but it's still a great piece of work. The problem with the new Twilight Zone is he isn't the writer director on the f- on the episodes that have been released so far. Ooh. And so they're not. I didn't think they were very strong. And and I think. Like with Rod Serling, Rod wrote 92 out of the 156 Twilight Zone episodes. So it was a huge... And, they, and he polished all of them. Right. I mean, they were all had, right. had his feeling. Right. It was his show, his viewpoint, his aesthetic, his work, his voice, everything. Is this a network decision to air no, them out of order? Or? No, no. And I don't know if he's writing and directing any of them. He's, oh, perhaps you know, he's and just so brought it back. We'll see. We'll see. But what they should have done, of course, was the first few episodes should have been every bit as handmade by Jordan Peele as us or as Get Out because that's what people were expecting. Yeah. I feel like b- between his successes yes. lately and the franchise itself, yes. the fact that it should be treated. Yes. <laughs> and, and and it's not yeah. that they're, they're deliberately trying to do a, a poor job. It's just that this is a very hard medium to pull off. The, the, this anthology, what Rod did, I mean, it's... I mean, like the twi- when they brought Twilight Zone back in the '80s, there were some great episodes, but it was much more hit and miss because you didn't have Rod at the top of it saying this is how it should be. And there's a great story about they experimented Rod. Experimented more with weird in that one yeah. too. It got a little, it was almost like half tales from the dark side. Yes, yes, yes. But also, you know, when Rod um, sold Twilight Zone, he wrote four pilot scripts before he was able to sell the show. He was very determined, and um, and then. He knew he couldn't write all of them, but he was writing most of them. And so he initially opened it up to unsolicited submissions. He said, everybody can send scripts in. They got 5,000 scripts. He he and his staff read through 500 of them, and none of them were, were, were any good. And so he didn't know what to do. So he called Ray Bradbury, who was the top science fiction writer at the time. And he said, what do I do? And Ray said, come over to the house. And he took him down into the basement where his office was, and he pulled out four books from the bookshelf. One was by John Collier, who was a British fantasy writer. One was by Ray himself, and two were by his protégés, Richard Matheson and Charles Beaumont. And he said, read these, and then let's talk. And so mm. so Rod bought a story by John Collier that he made into a Twilight Zone episode. He, there was one episode written by Ray that was made by Twilight Zone, and Richard Matheson and Charles Beaumont were hired as the major writers under Rod. And, and a third of Radbury's protégés was George Clayton Johnson, who became the other th- of the great Twilight Zone writers. And so... So, these so Ray was integral in he was. putting that team together. Well, the funny Who thing knew? was... I didn't know that. Well, the funny thing about Ray was... 
I tried to interview him when I wrote the Twilight Zone Companion. He 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 turned me down, and I'd heard that he and Rod, that their um, friendship had fallen apart over sure. something. And when I was up in Rod, Sur- uh, uh, Rod Serling's uh, attic, when I was researching The Twilight Zone Companion when I was in my 20s, um, I found this box in his attic, and it was unmarked. And I opened it, and there were Twilight Zone scripts that were bought but not made. Wow. And there were two by Ray Bradbury, and one had a handwritten note on the top saying, Dear Rod, here's the first of what will be many scripts for The Twilight Zone, looking forward to the, to the future, basically. And, and yet Bradbury only had one produced script, and it wasn't either of those two. So clearly something had gone very awry. But Bradbury wouldn't talk about it. Rod never talked about it publicly. So it was a mystery. So, um, and so The Twilight Zone Companion came out, and you know I just alluded to this, but I couldn't really answer it. And then, and I'd always wanted Ray Bradbury to be one of my mentors, but you know, you grow up, and I'd, I'd run into him a, a few times at conventions, but the, the, the lightning didn't strike, and I, so ultimately I'd sort of say, well, he's never going to be my friend or my mentor, and then one day, about 15 years ago, um, I had done this little DVD of um, Moby Dick, where I'd taken different performances by different people of Moby Dick, and amalgamated them into the ulti- the ultimate Moby Dick. So it was Charles Lawton as Ahab and uh, Richard Basehart as Ishmael from the version that Ray wrote for John Huston in the 50s and, and um, Gregory Peck as Father Mapple from the, the <laughs> miniseries. And it, I just put it together. as a, It was a 70-minute dramatic play. And, um, and I gave it to my friends as a Christmas present one year. I would never have given it to Ray Bradbury because he wrote the John Huston version and I was screwing with his work. <laughs> so one day I come home and on my answering machine there's a message. And the message oh. is, Mr. Zickery, this is Ray Bradbury. I've just listened to your Moby Dick. Please call me. And I think, fuck, I've pissed off Ray Bradbury. That's what I think. So I call him, and my, 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 you know, my heart is in my throat, and he says, he said, I loved it. He said, Charles Lawton was one of my dear friends. You must come to the house. So I went to the house. I went to his house in Cheviot Hills, and I went into his, his room where he had all this stuff from his career, and we just hit it off. And then for the next over 10 years, once a month I would go to Ray's house and we would just sit and talk about life and writing and art. And we had this amazing relationship. And he was a dear friend and mentor. And, um, and so I'm writing a book about him called My Ray Bradbury, uh, about all these things he told. And he told, so finally, at first I didn't tell him I'd written The Twilight Zone Companion because I knew he and Rod had a falling out. And so finally, after we became really good friends, I fessed up that I'd written this book, and I said, okay, Ray, tell me what happened between you and Rod, and he told me. And so on Mr. Sci-Fi, I shot a video of myself, and I said, okay, here's the story Ray told me, and it's going to take a while, so get a cup of coffee, and it takes about a half hour to tell the story, and it's about how they fell apart and how their friendship fell apart, and it's an amazing story. And wow. So I got that I, I can't got that wait on to the watch record. That. Yeah. I but, can't wait. But it was so amazing that I got to both be the, you know, the voice of the Twilight Zone, the world's expert on the Twilight Zone, and also got to be such friends with Ray Bradbury because it was a it was a dream come true. You know? Ugh, you're so fa- I mean this <laughs> Yeah. I hate to say it but if this were all uh if this were all after you yeah. died the story yes. is already so complete. Yeah. You know well, what I mean? Yeah. And you're still doing so much. Yes. Well, I'll tell you a funny story when I was at Ray's house one time I look over and there's an Oscar and I remembered that Ray had won an Emmy for The Halloween Tree, which was made as an animated Chuck Jones um, TV special adaptation of his book, The Halloween Tree. But he, I couldn't remember him winning an Oscar. So I said, Ray, what's the story with the Oscar? He said, oh, oh and a, a friend gave it to me. And <laughs> so, so I said, can I take a photo with that? He said, sure. So I took a photo with, with the Oscar. Where Ray took the photo of me. So it was like... <laughs> well, whose was it? It was, was it John Huston or something? A, no, there was an art director who was a neighbor of Ray's. And, and he knew that Ray wanted to have the Oscar. So when he died, he left it to Ray. Oh, that's so, lovely. Yeah. I mean, when, when you, you Isn't know, that great? Again, yeah. Died, yeah. It's great. But Ray kept everything. I mean, he was a, when he moved with his family to LA when he was 13 years old, he, he, he said, where's, where's this, tell me where a studio is. And they said, well, MGM is in Culver City. So that's too far. What's the nearest one? And Paramount was the nearest one. Mm-hmm. So he was 13 years old. He put on his roller skates. He roller skated to Paramount. And just as he got there, W.C. Fields was coming out. This is 1933. Oh, so this is and, the old gauge. Right. Paramount was a tiny little thing. Right. So yeah. he goes up to, he, he roller skates up to, to uh, W.C. Fields and he says, and I have your autograph. So he writes, so W.C. Fields writes him an autograph and hands it to him and says, there you are, you son of a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> Go away, can't you bother me? Exactly. <laughs> and, and so, but, but wait, one time when I visited Ray, he showed me this little wooden box. He handed it to me this little wooden box and inside were all the autographs from when he was a kid. So it was oh. like, it was, wow. um, it was uh, Marlena Dietrich and George Burns and on Everybody and on. who was on the lot Everybody. at the time, I bet. And he told me this amazing story. When he wrote Moby Dick and the, L- the premiere was held in L.A. and he was going up 
to um, with John Houston, his wife, and his wife. They were ha- walking up the steps to the theater for the red carpet premiere. And he looked over, and there was the, the velvet rope, and behind it were all the autograph hunters. And he noticed this woman and her son, who he had been an autograph hunter with when he was a kid, you know, going to premieres when he was like a, a teenager. When he was on the other and side of the road. And he walked up to them, and he said, how are you doing? And they said, oh, we're great. And they said, what are you doing here? And he said, well, I wrote that movie. And suddenly he was surrounded by autograph hunters signing autographs for them. And he said it was one of the greatest moments of his life. That's amazing. That's the full circle Amazing. thing. It was. It was. Oh. So again, you know, I'm so blessed to be doing what I love, to be to have my heroes become friends and collaborators. It's just amazing. It's just amazing. You're a treasure. I well, hope thanks. you know that. Thank you. I'm so I excited to get it. to know you yeah, through this. Well, Same. Thank you. Of course. I mean, just a, and of course, you guys are welcome. To my, well, you're re- welcome to my roundtable anytime you want to come. It's every Thursday I night. Would very much like yeah, that. It's Can't way wait. fun. It's way fun. But again, it's like. You know, at the end of your life, you look back and you say, what have I done that's been worth doing? What have I done that's made the world better? And that's the whole, that's the question. Have I made the world better? And then... What's your answer? Well, my answer is I, I have. And both in my work, whether it's real Ghostbusters or Smurfs or mm-hmm. Star Trek The Next Generation or, you know, Deep Space Nine or, you know, Space Command. Forgive me, that. you worked on Next Gen too? Yeah. That's yeah, yeah, yeah. A, a favorite of most of my friends. Yes. I think generationally speaking, oh, yeah. that yeah, was yeah. just the one we had. And Deep Space Nine was terrific to work on. I had two... I had, that, that happened it was very funny because I pitched the story it was called Far Beyond the Stars and the, one of the characters goes back to the 50s and he's a science fiction writer and it's one of the more acclaimed episodes and uh, uh, it took a year for it to sell I pitched it and took a year for it to sell so Hans Beimler who was one of the executive producers on DS9 called me at my office in Paramount when I was working on Sliders and said I have great news You've, uh, we're, we're buying Far Beyond the Stars I said great timing Hans because I, <laughs> oh I was writing two episodes of Sliders back to back and the only time I could even meet with their writing staff was at lunch so I drove over the hill to Nicodell which was next to uh, Paramount his restaurant met with the entire writing staff Brian Fuller Ron Moore everybody they're, not, they're all now showrunners Ira Bear and, um, and we batted out the story we worked out the story there at lunch and then I wrote the outline that, that weekend and so two different studios were shooting my work the same week so it was Sliders was shooting one of my episodes at, uh, at Universal and they were shooting my Deep Space Nine episode at Paramount the same week so I got a photo of myself the you same you just spent the whole time yes. on going a pass didn't well, you? Well I got, I, got, I got a photo of myself the same day with both casts with me in the same clothes oh. so, <laughs> so that was a Hollywood That's that so was a cool. dream come true dream come true and, uh, and now I'm working with a lot of the same actors again you know so and, but I don't have to wait for the studio or the networks to uh, to make anything happen, and, and I'm writing the book Green Lighting Yourself to let people know how they can do all this stuff too. It's like a cake recipe. You said that earlier, yeah. Green Lighting Yourself. Yeah, I said yeah. great segue. Yeah. Uh, can we talk about that oh, a little sure. bit? Because we, we yeah. touched on it a little bit before the show, and yep. it's something that, that Mrs. Yeah. Ryan and I didn't used to really understand, and yeah. we've since done it. Of course, of course. Well, again, you know. Before the internet, before crowdfunding, any of that stuff, it was impossible. If you wanted to reach an audience of millions of people, you had to have a studio and a network and or a major publisher if you were wanted to do books. None of that is true anymore at all. And so, so many people make such a mistake writing a script and waiting somehow to get an agent, somehow to get a studio or a network to buy it, and they spend their lives in longing, and, and their hearts are broken, and they go back to, you know... Uh, wherever they're from, you know, uh, the Botswana, and they think, well, they think, I guess I didn't have what it took. And they might have been wonderful. They might have had incredible talent, but they were, they were sort of barking up the wrong tree. Yeah, and or s- waiting for it to happen. Right, right. right. And, and so, so what you have to do is you have to say, well, if it were all up to me to make it happen. See, another thing science fiction never predicted was that we would all have video cameras in our pockets, you know, and F- so... Film cameras, really. I right. Mean, feature film. And so, you know, really... If someone says, I want to be a director, well, what's your excuse not to do that now? There's no barrier right. now. Right. I mean, you know, I, I often say anything worth doing is worth doing badly. Because if you at least do it and you're lousy, you can get better. But you're at least doing it. Mm. You know, and then you learn from your mistakes. Whereas if you're just kind of longing and waiting and hoping that Quentin Tarantino will recognize your genius, well, <laughs> yeah. good, good luck. You know, good luck. And, no, but, you're right. It's you the even Wayne Gretzky going to your hockey thing, isn't it? Like right. 100% of the shots you don't take, yeah. don't right. you miss or something. Right, exactly. Yeah. Makes perfect sense. Exactly. So, so green lighting yourself. I sold the book. I sold the book. I taught a class called Green Lighting Yourself. And then I went on Amazon to see if anyone had written a book with that name. And I was stunned that no one had. So I emailed two uh, friends of mine who were book editors at, di- at two different publishers, and I said, would you like a book called Greenlighting Yourself? And one of them, Silman James, emailed me back, said yes. And so I met with my editor and just told him what I had in mind, and, and Elaine and I are writing the book now. It comes out this year. So and so Part of it, obviously, is the, the technical, the physical, the literally today we have the technology and the ability yeah. to do these things. But yeah. is part of it uh, more about overcoming the obstacles that one puts yes. in front of, and it's yes. not so much about the camera and the crew well, and everything else versus, ah, well, oh, I don't know if I can do it. Yeah, I mean, no, it's the thing of, 
you know, don't stop yourself. I mean, if you have a dream, I, I saw a great quote from Tony Robbins the other day. It was like, if you have a dream, if you dream something, it's a fantasy. If oh. you talk about it, it's a goal. If you set a date, it's a reality. Interesting. You know, and that's true. And that's true. And so, you know, I'm rolling camera on the rest of the second two-hour Space Command sh uh, episode, Jan uh, July 1st. Mm. And so that means I have to raise money, and I have to make it happen. I have to. Build you don't seem worried about it. No, you know it'll happen. No, I have to build an alien hibernation ship. We have to build three creature suits. Rock and roll. <laughs> Great. But we have already shot 40 minutes of that episode, because when, after we shot the two-hour pilot of Space Command, and again, you can watch the, first, the full hour on my YouTube channel, Mr. Sci-Fi, um, when, when I shot the two-hour pilot, I was going to close the studio down and put everything in storage because I had to shift the money oh, to post. Oh, you have post. a physical space, of course. Yeah, I had, I had my own studio for a couple of years. Physical studio. And I own a red camera and sound equipment and a jib and all that stuff. But I put it, was putting it in storage. But when I looked at the sets and the costumes and the props I had, I realized that I could shoot 40... I, I wrote the first eight hours of the 12-hour season before I shot any of it. And... Because um, I'm a TV guy. Right. And... Um, but I, I realized that I could shoot 40 minutes of the second two-hour script for very little money because I had the props and the sets and the costumes. So I reached out to my, my investors. And within a week, they'd sent me $40,000, and that was enough to roll camera. So we shot 40 minutes of, and it had, it had James Hong from Blade Runner and Big Trouble in Little China. He's the one in Blade Runner who says, I just make eyes, I make eyes. Oh, and, yeah, uh, of course. And he was the villain, so in, and, he's yeah, the, and he's the villain in Big Trouble in Little China. And so I wrote a role for him and for Ron Tahir, who's he's in the J.J. J. J. Abrams Star Trek movies, this Federation captain who gets skewered by the Romulans at the beginning. And he's in Iron Man. He's in a ton of stuff. And, um, you know, I just cast people I love. And they all say yes, and it's hugely fun. And so we're going to shoot the rest of that two-hour story in July, and then probably in the fall we'll shoot the next one, the next two-hour story. You just jumped around to something. It's almost like you yeah. can see my card. I'm telling you, <laughs> you have X-ray vision. Uh, you brought up the J.J. Abrams yes. Star Trek yes. uh, franchise. Or yes. Or whatever you would call that yeah. saga. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I was, I mentioned I was working at Paramount and Everybody Hates yes. Chris. That happened to be at the same time that they shot the J.J. Abrams uh, Star Trek, yeah. the first one. Yes. I also used to work previously for J.J. Abrams on oh, a different cool. show when it was on Felicity. When oh, that's fun. Felicity back that's when I met him. Yeah. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, all right. Well, uh, so, so that was my history with J.J. Abrams. It was one yeah. year way back, probably 10 years earlier. Yes. Uh, his assistant at the time happened to still be the same, uh, you know, he was a writer's assistant or something. Huh. Like so we knew each other. One wow. thing led to another. Yeah. And uh, I was able to go see the set. And I, if you that, remember it, at the I was time, on the, I was it on was that set. It was locked down. It was yeah. so locked the, down. The they built it above. It, yeah. it looked uh, like an Apple store. Yeah. Yeah. And the really? Dome, the dome yeah, slid the on and off of yeah. the set. It was set. cool. It was on a whole big thing because yeah. so they, cause they oh, could light neat. in or bring the dome. And it had these monitors that wrapped all the way around as the as the, as the ship's monitors on the bridge set. It was a gorgeous but they all, set. Everything worked. Everything yeah. was real. It was so a gorgeous set. Oh, that's like, so live. Neat. It was super cool. Yeah, I was there. But like nobody. Futuristic. Yeah, yeah. And I was. it was like a thing. It was like, all right, well, we can walk through there, but yes. you need to shut the fuck up and don't yes. fucking look at it. <laughs> right. I mean, like, that's don't touch anything. That's great. But we can go in. Yeah, that's swell. And that was one of the things that at the time was like, I don't know what the heck it was, but the fact that I knew a couple people that could get yes. me in there, all of a sudden my stock on the log out, it was <laughs> well, like, oh, wait a second, yeah. you can go into stage whatever they were <laughs> shooting it on? Well, well, I'll tell you how I met JJ. Um, the Museum of Radio and Television at the Paley Center at, in Beverly Hills. Did I still a, say MTR too. Yeah, they, they did They did a, uh, a night devoted to Twilight Zone, the original Twilight Zone. And so they had 15 people who had worked on the shows, act, uh, actors, writers, directors, producers, and me. Hmm. And so I was up on the stage. And it was very funny because anytime they asked a question, it had been so long ago that, that the guests wouldn't remember, but I would. <laughs> so by the end of the... Of the, of the and, and I actually, well, there was one question where I knew the answer and I didn't say because I, it was embarrassing. Yeah, because yeah, I, yeah. It was like, because I, I was sitting on, I sat on the far side and all the heads were turned toward me of the panelists to answer the question and um, and so and it was about 3,000 people in the audience something like that and at the end of the evening uh, a guy came up from the audience and he said um, hi Mr. Zikri I'm a big fan of your work I'd love to take you to lunch my name's J.J. Abrams and <laughs> so this is when <gasps> that sounds right. like the guy from yeah. Felicity he was yeah. just kind of yeah. a, a, yeah. a and so, eager he was still eager yeah, oh, so he had, so by the so way uh, we should say this too he was incredibly accomplished by the time he had done Felicity we yes. make it sound like Felicity yes. was at the beginning no. of his career he'd yeah. already written Forever Young he'd already right. Written, regarding uh, Henry, the, the, uh, regarding yeah. Henry, he done yeah. a polish on Armageddon. I right. mean, he has been he working had already. Anything to do with Armageddon? I didn't know. Yeah, that. he wrote yeah, a rewrite yeah. out of yeah. it for sure. Yeah, oh, no idea. Yeah. so he'd been around when Felicity. Right. this was pre-Alias, but he'd already been around. Right. So I had lunch with JJ, and we hit it off. We became friends, and um, and then a very interesting thing happened. The uh, I was on a panel because I'd written for Star Trek: The Next Generation and Deep Space Nine. I was on a panel at a science fiction convention, and this is just when Enterprise was on the air, and the fans really didn't like it much, and it was kind of winding Scott down. Scott right? Yeah, after yeah. four seasons, it was winding down, 
And I was on panel with all these different people from all the different iterations of Star Trek, including Walter Koenig, who played Chekhov on the original mm. show. And someone from the audience asked, what's the future of Star Trek? And Walter told a story that was so peculiar that I sat down with him afterwards, and I said, tell me all about this. Yeah. And what he told me was that there were a group of fans in upstate New York who had gotten the... the, the blueprints of the original Star Trek sets and oh, had built... this is true. Yes, this is true. They had built replicas of all the original Star Trek sets and they were shooting their own Star Trek episodes, putting them on, on online and getting more viewers than Enterprise was getting on UPN. Yeah. So I went there and he was... And Walter was about to fly up to upstate New York and do an episode yeah. written by DC Fontana who had story edited the original Star Trek and written episodes and he was going to play Chekhov in this fan film, right? So I went that night and I watched some of the episodes they'd done and... And, you know, some of the fan actors weren't at, at a professional level, but the visual effects were great, the sets were great, the costumes were great. Yeah, the, and the lighting and everything, right. technically and, it was great. And the spirit was there, the, the passion and the, and the love of it. And so years ago, when Star Trek was going to come back in the 70s as a TV show, a friend of mine, uh, Michael Reeves, who actually brought me into television in the first place, had pitched a story, the great Sulu story, to Paramount. And, and I'd always wanted to work with George Takei, and it was a great story. But because Star Wars came out and they made the Star Trek movies, they pulled the plug on that show, mm. and it never got made. So I remember that story, and I called Michael, because we're, we're very good friends, and I said, would you like to um, do this? Would you like to write this with me if, if we can get these fans up in upstate New York to say yes? And I'd also been looking for something to direct as sort of my, my, my sample. And so I called the boys in upstate New York, and I said, hey, um, Michael Reeves and I both wrote for Star Trek The Next Generation. Michael's an Emmy winner. Uh, we'd like to do the Sulu episode. So, and I want to direct it. And they said, okay. And, <laughs> and, but they'd been shooting mini-DV, and I said, well, we have to shoot HD. They said, if you can get the cameras, okay. Right. So then I went to George Takei's house, and um, I sat down with George. I, wrote, I typed up the outline <laughs> in three pages, and it was different from what Michael had pitched because Star Trek Gen The Next Generation had done some similar things so I revised it so it was all on the ship and all with Sulu. Sulu gets moved for 30 years. He has a daughter. Oh. She's never been anywhere and doesn't know anybody. And she, they're, they're brought to the ship. At, and it's all in the wink of an eye on the Enterprise. It's, and so I sat down with George. And I said, you're a wonderful actor. I've, I've seen you in things beyond Star Trek. You're brilliant, but you never got the great Sulu episode. And, oh. and I need you to read this three pages and tell me if you'll do it. And he read it and he said, I'm in. And so I then spent six months building a production team of with my keys, my, my, the heads of my departments from L.A., I cast Christina Moses as his daughter. She's now starring in um, A Million Little Things on ABC. This was the beginning of her career. She'd never done TV. Wow. She'd only done, done New York stage. And so we, we built our team for six months. We wrote the script. And then Elaine and I went flew to upstate New York. We had an actor's camp where we, t we did improv and scene study with the, the fan actors that I had to utilize uh, to see who had chops, who, mm -hmm. who was good. And then I wrote the script gearing it toward who was strong as an actor. And I, so, so George Decay and Elaine and I went up to upstate New York. We shot for nine days on the Enterprise sets. But I was, how was that for you to see the sets and everything great. from when just you were a great. kid? Just great, just great. Because you saw them, you yeah. did the last episode Phenomenal. when he was a kid. Phenomenal. You know what I mean? It's yeah. really, really but I, cool. But I, but I said to Michael, we're not going to step back from this. We're going to write this exactly as if it were a network show. And we actually, it had 700 visual effects shots, which even a network show would never have. Not from those and, days. <laughs> and it was a solid year of post. We shot two days here in LA where we built Sulu's ship. There was a wraparound on his ship years later. And then a day in uh, Orlando with the effects team. Uh, and it took a year of post. But before I shot it was when J.J. announced he was going to do the Star Trek movie. So I had lunch with J.J. I said, I said to J.J., would you like to meet uh, Rod Serling's widow, Carol? He said, sure. So we had lunch, the three of us at Disney. And um, uh, I said, J.J., I'm going to be shooting this, this thing with George Takei. Do you mind? Is that okay with you? Is that cool with you? He said, oh. fine. Because I didn't want business affairs to say, hear about this, go to J.J. Abram and, and he, he would pull the plug not knowing it was me and I didn't want to put a year and a half of my life into something that would never see the light of day. You also didn't even know if he was going right. to use George right. or right. what, right? So, I say, so he said, it's fine. So then I knew I was okay. And, um, and it's funny because there were two people who were table hopping at the end of our lunch. One was uh, the head of the studio, Bob Iger, <laughs> and the other was Steven Spielberg. And so Spiel, Spielberg comes up. It. It's great. And, Spiel, and this was the executive dining suite where like, you know, anyone else who tries to get in there is like tased. In the and, yeah, or whatever. exactly. Yeah. And so, and so Spielberg comes over, and JJ introduces me as the author of the Twilight Zone Companion. And Spielberg says, "I live by that book." <laughs> oh, come on. Yes. And but I was—it was funny because I had a camera with me, but I was too shy to get a photo with Spielberg. So 
the, so the funny thing was, so on my you, Facebook page, there's a picture of me with Guillermo del Toro because I wrote a book with Guillermo recently and, um, and a photo with JJ and a photo with George Lucas who, was, who I ran into at a hamburger hamlet, oddly oh enough. Oh my gosh. But I didn't have the photo with Spielberg. So I went to Madame Tussauds here in LA and I got a photo of myself with the wax <laughs> with figure the wax. of Spielberg. <laughs> so if you look at this photo, these photos of me with all these A-list <laughs> directors, Spielberg's a little bit waxy. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's amazing. Um, I could go on and on. We've already gone an hour and a half. Yeah. I don't want to take yeah. any more of your that's time, fine. but I, I'm hoping that we get a chance to have uh, yeah. a conversation again in the future, and we would very much like to come to your, of your Thursday roundtable. Of course. And by the way, if anyone wants to watch that, that Sulu episode, it got nominated for the Hugo and the Nebula, which are the two top awards in science fiction, and it's on Mr. Sci-Fi. You can, you can actually watch that in its entirety. Oh, no kidding. Yeah. We, uh, we, used, to awesome. know, we used to know the Mythbusters pretty yeah, well, sure. and Grant yeah. Imahara was a big fan, and he ended up uh -huh. doing an episode, I believe, wow. on that same Right. Yes. Set or somewhere. Yes. For, for, I don't know. Probably oh, right. not yours. It's, but yeah, but it's cool. Something. Yeah, it's amazing. And when he was, uh, you know, very excited about flying out to do it and the whole thing, yeah. but he sent the pictures and then you look wow. at it and it's you're amazing. like. It's amazing. Well, now it's a museum because Paramount ultimately did pull the plug on the Star Trek fan films. Oh. And so they've now turned it into a museum where you can go up to upstate New York and they turn on all the lights and Great. all the sounds. Because that's what it yeah. would be to go there and yeah. to be in the amazing. Enterprise. But now they have a thing where you can actually go there and make a little fan film that you can just have for yourself. And, just you not know, to make yeah. money off Yeah, exactly. That's kind of cool. But it's very fun. But I Again, it all comes from the love of it. And again, the fans and the pros, it's all merged now. It's, there's no, those, those lines of demarcation don't exist anymore. It's, it's who has the willingness to pick up camera, to learn how to run camera, do sound, maybe learn VFX, editing. I mean, these if things are If you're brave all, enough, you can green light yourself. Well, if you, if you own a, a, a phone and a laptop and, and you're on the internet, you have your own studio, basically. Yeah. We yeah. all know that now. You can do it. Yeah. Uh, all right, we do a little thing here where I just record you for social media where you tell us where we can find you. It sounds like the YouTube channel and whatever, but yes. if there's anything else, by you, all means. You can find me on Mr. Sci-Fi on YouTube, and Wait. I'm also on Facebook and Twitter, and, and I wander around the streets of Los Angeles. <laughs> oh, blurry. <laughs> I'll figure out how to do this. I don't know. Um, so, but did you say, is there a, do you have a, a, a Instagram or anything? Uh, not with, uh, or a, we're a, setting one up. But but mainly there's I'm on, no wrong answer. I'm on Facebook as Mark Zickery. I'm on Twitter as at Mark Zickery, and uh, Mr. Sci-Fi is on YouTube, and I post every few days. Every few days, Mr. Sci-Fi yeah. on YouTube. Mm -hmm. It's fun. It's really fun, and I'm very grateful to everyone who gives me a word of kindness or lobs <laughs> a few dollars my way or any of it. Yeah, it's a, it's a wonderful thing. I'm gonna go watch your stuff. It's I'm cool. so fascinated because yeah. yeah, I got right two now new subscribers. Yeah, <laughs> we switched. To, uh, he was telling you a little bit, but like yeah. I write now, so yeah. it's like it's fascinating to hear real writers talk. Yeah, that's why I love real comedy. Yes, and everyone thinks they're funny, and yes. I totally understand. Right. Everyone thinks they're a writer, and I right. totally understand because yeah. they have a journal. Sure, fine. Right. But like I love hearing the brains of real mm. word wordsmiths yeah. and yes. mathematicians. Yeah, I know. For me, it's the open mindedness. That's what yes. comes across from you it's that you're, ne you're never going to put that barrier up no. everything is possible no. everything is open well, everything they, is well, almost a yeah. whimsical place to live and well they stay. did they did a documentary on on my round table where they followed us for a year and back in 2009 and um one of our members who's central in the documentary was um he was a writer director actor producer he'd been one of the leads on highway to heaven <gasps> and he was a quadriplegic Oh my goodness! And we and we helped him make a pilot with Brian Cranston. I loved High, Highway to Heaven, but yeah, way. yeah. But I mean, he's you know <laughs> so <laughs> amazing things happen. You look at you. Yeah, it's fun. You're such a warm person. Oh, I, you thanks. must know yeah. all of that, right? I mean, yeah. it's just that I just <laughs> met you today. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. I'm good. Well, thanks. no, my, my wife my wife keeps my feet on the ground. You know, it's like That's so wonderful. You know, I hope we get to meet your. Oh, wife you will. Yeah. She runs the table with me. She's there. She's there when I'm there. Elaine's so, there. Yeah, her she's great. She's great. She's much better than I am in every way. So you're a delight. Thank you so much for coming and talking to us. Thank you. So much. This has been swell. Yeah, well, thanks. Yeah, well, stay there. Stay there. It's all right. Stay there. Okay. Um, you bet. Mrs. Ryan, let's see. What do we have tomorrow? Sue Kalinsky. Who's Sue Kalinsky? A comedian. The sausage king of <laughs> <laughs> Ray Walensky, the She's auto parts guy. <laughs> uh, comedian? Is this comedian. from Richard Chasler? Yes, it is. Awesome. Excited about that. Fantastic. Yeah. So tomorrow, Sue, Sue Kalinsky. I'm on a last name thing today. I can't seem to do that. <laughs> Look at the card every time. It is what it is. Uh, in the meantime, Mrs. Ryan, I love you very much. Love you too. Mm -hmm. Mark, we love you very much. Thank love you very you much so for much. being here. Thanks, I've, I've loved it. We love everybody at home. Please love one another, and we will see you tomorrow. Great. Yeah. Roll. That's great. Yeah. Okay. Good. Oh my gosh. It's every Thursday, six thirty. You guys are more than welcome.